Welcome to the seventh mini lecture in 7505 NSC Project Management. In the previous lectures, we've been talking about how we develop the scope of a project, that is, what it takes to actually get the project done. We also spoke about how we go about performing the project. And of course, one of the things that we've figured out already is that one of the questions that a project manager always asks is, how are we going on budget and how are we going on schedule? And this business of budget is really important, and that's what we're going to be doing in this lecture. Cost estimation and budgeting. Now, something I say on every course is, if you were to ask a project manager if there was one thing, if you could do it better, what would it be? And I can tell you, if you ask a project manager worth their salt, they will say, I wish we could estimate costs more accurately. Because that's where a lot of the problems occur in project management, as we've discussed in the previous mini-lectures. So this is a particularly important one. So in cost estimation budgeting, we're going to be describing the cost management project and, pro and uh, project costs. We're going to be explaining the differences between the different forms of project costs. That is, there's not just one. We're going to be describing the different forms of cost estimation, including ballpark and definitive estimates. We're going to talk about parametric cost estimation and learning curve models. And we're going to explain why cost estimation is done poorly, especially in relation to software cost estimation. Do you remember that from the previous lecture? I said, whenever you think of software, think of high risk. And risk is involved with cost estimation. And finally, we're going to explain how top-down and bottom-up budgeting are done and apply the concepts and problems. And one of the problems will be a particularly interesting one because we'll be looking at Richard Branson's uh, Virgin Galactic uh, space uh, vehicle. So, cost estimation, let's take a look at a history. It's a natural first step in determining if a project is viable. That is, you know, it's like when you actually go around to look at a house you want to build. The first thing you're going to have is a budget and you're going to look at houses and say, can I afford these houses? And it's the same in any project. Cost estimation is really important. And the one thing is, in airlines and aerospace, the one thing that we come up against is high technology. And whenever we've got high technology, we can run into big problems. Let's take a look. Concord, cost over five times the original estimate. Nuclear power plants usually cost two to three times estimates. And don't forget, nuclear power plants are now part of aerospace technology. And the NASA spacecraft. National Aeronautics and Space Administration spacecraft often exceed estimates by a factor of four to five. And of course we know from uh, both the Airbus 380 and from the Boeing 787 that there were huge cost overruns there because they encountered problems they just didn't expect to happen. So as one of the senators, uh, Everett uh, Dirksen, said at a US Senate estimates hearing after uh, being told about all the defence budgets that were running over their budget, he said, a billion here, a billion there, pretty soon it starts to add up to real money. Tongue in cheek, but it's true on projects. So what are the common sources of project costs? Well, obviously, labour. I always say, when you're thinking about projects and you're trying to think of uh, things from first principles rather than just trying to memorise, think of building a house. Next one, of course, is materials. And of course, this is the specific equipment and supplies, the subcontractors that you get in, and the equipment and facilities that you might need, and the travel. Now, those are the five categories, sorry, five categories of sources of cost. And as I said, those five are what you encounter when you build a house, but they're exactly the same ones that you get when you build yourself an Airbus 350 or a Boeing 787. So that's not hard to remember. Cost estimate development. The one thing is that cost estimate development is really a difficult thing because the one thing that we know is that if we're dealing with simple projects such as building a house, that's easy. Yeah, millions of houses have been built and people can often estimate the cost of building a house almost down to the nearest dollar. It's when you get a bespoke house, something that's different from all the other houses, you run into problems. So very often you've come up against problems of feasibility, uncertainty, and say, well, you know, this is something we haven't done before. So what are the uncertainties there? And the one thing is we know that when you're dealing with high uncertainty, you generally lead to cost plus contracts. 
That is, there's risk involved, but low uncertainty leads to fixed price. So I'm building a project home, for example, they're called project homes because they just build them one after the other. They don't vary very much and any small variation, they nail down pretty well. So generally you can sign up to a fixed price, a fixed price contract. But if you have an architect design home with lots of different angles, etc. Very often the builder might say, well, we're going to have to use different materials that we've never used before, and they'll go to a cost plus contract. And then, of course, in the execution phase, you get into the design, the fabrication, and the implementation. That's when you start to find out just how true your costs were. So what you're always aiming to do is to get like a seesaw, a balance with, between cost and time and the amount of um, scope, the effort involved, and all the other things that go into building a project. And of course, when you start to get your specifications, your effort, etc., running over, of course, this immediately causes an imbalance and immediately your time and costs start going up. This is where we get scope creep. And this is why, for example, on defence projects, such as the Joint Strike Fighter, we get scope creep as people start to say, what say we start to add a little bit here and a little bit there so we can make the particular platform uh, work better? And of course, we'll look at real world examples of where this has happened. If we look at cost classifications, we have a whole range of cost classifications. We divide them basically into four different headings. We get direct and indirect costs. That is direct costs are those that you can see immediately. The indirect costs are what you need in the company to be able to support it. For example, the IT might support your project, but the information technology supports lots of other functions of the organisation. So this is an indirect cost. You actually use the service, but you can't see it directly. You, we get the recurring and the non-recurring costs. And non-recurring costs could be research and development. They're done one off, the marketing may be done one off, but then you get the recurring costs such as you would get, um, for example, in fabricating part of the fuselage structure for a Boeing 787 for the prototype, you know that that's going to be a recurring cost once you uh, iron out any problems when it goes onto the production line. You get the fixed and variable costs. That is, there are certain things that are going to cost uh, a fixed amount, whereas there are certain things, variable costs. For example, building your house, you might have to hire a backhoe to come in to clear for the foundations, and you pay for the hour. That is, the more complex the foundations, the more hours and so, that's a variable cost. Whereas if we uh, take a look at other things in the house, uh, certain of the fixed costs will be the cost of labour for carpenters erecting the structure. And then of course we get the normal and the expedited costs. The normal costs are, if the project's going on time, everything's fine. But the expedited costs, if you're behind schedule, you might have to get people to work overtime to get back on schedule. That's going to cost you more. And then we relate all of those different uh, cost classifications to, for example, the direct labour, a building lease, an expedited uh, project and the materials themselves. And we can see, as we'll see in the project, that the way in which the cost classifications acquired to the different cost elements varies. Well, then they look at cost estimation methods. And we have a number of different methods depending on the amount of accuracy we want in our cost estimation. At the top, we have the ballpark, giving you plus or minus 30%. But a comparative cost is guaranteed to have that down to plus or minus 15%. And this is where people say, well, we've done that before on something else that's very similar. Let's use that as a basis for a comparison cost. Boeing, for example, uses that in its parametric estimation, and all aircraft manufacturers would use a similar method. We get the feasibility that uses guidance based on real data gathered from the preliminary design work. That is, the more design we do, the better the idea we've got as to where the problems might be. And the final one is the definitive. That is, we actually take a look at very, very detailed data, and that gets us down to plus or minus 5%. But to get down to that level of granularity, we've got to do a lot of work. So you can see the ballpark at the top at least gives you a rough idea, a rough order of magnitude, whereas the definitive takes a lot more time, but it does give you a more accurate idea. And we'll look at those. We'll take a look at the learning curve graph. And basically, this graph simply says that 
The more times we repeat a certain activity, the more we learn and we become more efficient. And of course we can see this learning curve graph applied in a real world case here uh, with the Boeing 787. Let's look at some of the cost estimation problems because we've been talking about, well, this is what you can do, but we know that problems do occur. Why is this so? Well, first of all, we can get low e uh, initial estimates simply because people don't understand the scope. And we spoke about that in scope before. The better you define the scope, the more idea you get of cost. Or you might not realise the technical complexity. There's the desire to win the work at any cost. Companies, when they are finishing a project, they want to find work for their workforce. So to win a, at the next job, they may underbid just to get that work. And also, there's a corporate culture that rewards op over optimism. There's the unexpected technical difficulties, and a good example of this would be the Boeing V-22 Osprey aircraft. This is a um, vertical takeoff and landing aircraft that can rotate the engines and fly at a high speed in level flight. And of course, uh, Boeing, who developed this aircraft in uh, conjunction uh, with other companies, found problems that they hadn't expected, especially in tilting the engines, and they had a, uh, a very, very uh, terrible accident, simply because they hadn't realised just how complex it would be. Then we get a lack of definition, simply because either the customer doesn't understand the actual work they want done, and combined with that, the contractor may not have done it before, both are on a learning curve, and so they have to learn a lot more about the actual problems to be overcome to get a good idea of cost. And this is a simple fact of life. Of course, activity-based costing is one where we actually sit down and say, well, if we know actually what the cost drivers are and what the cost of those cost drivers are and we've got an, a, a good idea of the time, we can get a much more accurate figure simply by saying, what are the resources, what do they cost, what are the cost drivers? It could be the cost per hour or the hiring cost per day of a particular piece of material. And then we can simply use a multiplication factor to find out what that cost is. We come up against the concept of developing budget contingencies. And these budget contingencies are where we put money aside for those unexpected extra costs. That is, these are some of the risks that we're going to have to deal with. Both the risks we predict and the risks that we can't predict. This is sometimes called budget reserve or management reserve. The important thing is these are not slush funds. Some people always think of it, we'll always put a little bit aside, keep that there just in case things go wrong. There is a way in which we can calculate our budget con and that contingencies fairly accurately and they're not slush funds. A project manager wants to go through a project without using them and so it adds to the profit of the project but they are very, very carefully managed. And the b big thing is the project scope may change. That is, we said we didn't really predict it accurately. Murphy's Law, that is, if the unexpected can happen, it probably will happen. Cost estimation often doesn't look at interaction costs between different activities. And of course, the one thing we know on projects, especially complex projects, is that normal conditions are rarely encountered. If something can go wrong in a plan, it probably will. So in this particular um, in that mini lecture, we've looked at cost management process itself. We've explained the difference between the different forms of project costs. We've looked at the forms of cost estimation and we've explained why cost estimation is done poorly. In the lecture itself, of course, we will be going into top-down and bottom-up budgeting and taking a look at how these are actually done and applying these in practical exercises, including the Virgin Galactic uh, project being developed by Richard Branson. Thank you.